Good morning and welcome to worship on this, the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. We're going to worship under the theme of, of faith generating the right choice, which is following Christ. And in the sermon, as we wrap up John chapter six, we'll be answering that question that's on the screen behind me, to whom shall we go? We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by his perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of Jesus, who entered our human story with grace unbounded, dear friends. If it makes you happy, no one else's opinion should matter. Have you ever run across a statement like that or, or something similar? At first glance, it may sound like a tolerant and even thoughtful way of, of looking at things. And yet modern society has taken that statement too far, making it more of a defensive battle cry for anyone to use when, when being confronted or corrected by another. It reminds me of what was said about the people of Israel at the time of the judges in the Old Testament. It says, everyone did as they saw fit, or as some translations have it, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone followed their own moral compass, defective as it may have been, in determining how to live. And I imagine that if anyone did oppose a decision being made at that time, they were met with similar accusations made today of a person being judgmental or unfairly critical. Generations of sinners have come and gone, and yet the sinful nature still is quick to question, if not even oppose, the will of God. I've shared with you uh, from time to time my fear that we as Christians are slowly but surely being silenced when it comes to standing up and speaking up for what is right. Our, our self-imposed gag order has made it all the easier for people to believe that everyone is free to do whatever makes them happy, whatever they feel is right. And sadly, this attitude also negatively impacts one's spiritual welfare, as people are led to foolishly believe that they have the answers within themselves as to how to pave their way to heaven. Well, this morning, we're clearly shown there's only one place to turn, not only for a moral compass, but especially when it comes to our salvation. Jesus has the final answer. Let's use that as our theme. Yes, Jesus has that final answer. His words, we'll learn today, are often hard and offensive to some, and yet his words are eternal life for believers. We're wrapping up John chapter six uh, this morning. We know the people who had been following Jesus uh, the last few days, well, they fell into three basic groups. The first group was made up of those who seemed to be constantly looking to argue with him. They're described earlier in this chapter as those who began to grumble about him and who began to argue sharply among themselves. Their main goal? Well, it was to find fault with Jesus, try, to try and discredit him before the people in any way possible. And then you had two other groups. 
They're the ones mentioned in, our, in the words before us today. One group was made up of those who had decided to follow Jesus as their rabbi or their teacher, anxious to learn from this man of God. The last group, well, we might call them the inner circle of our Lord, consisting of the 12 disciples who eventually ended up following him on a full-time basis. It's the second group of disciples, the learners who look to Jesus as their teacher, the larger part of the crowd that's mentioned in the opening verse of our text. They were having some trouble digesting Jesus' whole bread of life sermon. Verse 60, it says, on hearing it, many of his disciples of the larger group of followers said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Their intellect was rebelling against what Jesus was telling, to, telling them. And it really wasn't that they couldn't understand what he was saying. But they just couldn't accept it. They, they did understand that Jesus was a special teacher sent by God, and he had power to do godly things. And there might have been some of them even open to seeing him as the promised Messiah. But this bread of life uh, language, they, they couldn't accept him as such. Someone who came down from heaven, whose, whose flesh they, they were to eat and whose blood they were to drink for eternal life. To them, who could accept such a teaching? Who could stomach such words? And so many of the same people who had eaten the physical bread that Jesus produced when he fed the 5,000, they couldn't swallow the spiritual food Jesus was offering now. And why not? What was keeping them from going all in with Jesus? Well, they found his words just a bit too offensive to their way of thinking. That's what comes up in the next two verses, 61 and 62. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this. Again, this is that larger group. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? Jesus knew it was in these people's hearts. Instead of believing him, they were planning to abandon him. And instead of taking his words to heart, well, they were using him as a roadblock. They accepted the miracles of Jesus, but not his words. And what well, Jesus says, what's it going to take to convince you? Would they believe if they actually saw him ascend back to where he claimed he had come from? Would, would they believe then? Well, even then, not without some help. Not without the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Jesus continues, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that are spoken to you are spirit. And they are life. Jesus wasn't speaking of earthly matters. His discussion centered on the spiritual. And for anyone to make sense of what he was saying, they would take power outside themselves. It would take the power of the Holy Spirit. And those who relied on their own limited intellect were foolishly trusting in their own flesh, which Jesus says really counts for nothing. Our flesh is flawed. It's corrupt, sinful, and incapable of grasping the things of God. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us simply in Corinthians, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. As Jesus says, only the Spirit can give us life. And that's important for us present-day believers who can't physically gather around, around Jesus as the Jews did during his time on this earth. You and I did not have the opportunity to see him ascend back to his heavenly home. And yet somehow, we still believe that he exists. How is that possible? After all, we've all had bedtime stories read to us when we were young. But in time, we learned that the vast majority of them were what we would call fairy tales. They were just make-believe. So why haven't we come to the same conclusion about the story of Jesus. Jesus tells us why in verse 64. No one can come to me unless the Father, in verse 65, no one has come to me unless the Father has enabled him. The Father makes it possible to come to Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's convinced us that Jesus does exist, that his story is more than just some kind of bedtime tale. That everything he did for us is real. When it comes to our salvation, the Spirit has convinced us that Jesus has the final answer. 
How does the Holy Spirit work this knowledge into our hearts? Well, don't, excuse my cat's interruption. How does the Holy Spirit work this knowledge into our hearts? Well, don't expect him just to zap you into believing. He, he could, but really, that's not his style. Instead, he's chosen to come to each of us through the simple yet powerful word. In public worship in God's house, you have the readings, the hymn, the sermon. They all bring us God's saving message. In holy baptism, we, we see faith created. In the Lord's Supper, we see faith strengthened, both being accomplished by the Spirit, working through that same word. And in your own personal Bible study and your devotions in your homes, you again have the opportunity for the Spirit to work in you. Yes, the Spirit brings to each of us the very words of God, and it's only by the Spirit's power that we accept them. Well, keep in mind, no one is forced to accept those words. His words can be rejected. And Jesus points this out to the crowd in verse 64. There are some of you who do not believe. And then it says, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. See, Jesus was aware of the many skeptics in the crowd following him, including the one who would betray him. And yet that doesn't mean he approved of their rejection. He could see into their hearts and he knew that some of them they would, would find his words too hard to accept. And even though Jesus had the answer they needed, he knew that some would still look elsewhere. This moment in Jesus' life would prove to be a turning point in his ministry because many would start losing interest in what he had to offer. We're told in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Many went back to their former way of life. They gave up on following Jesus. After he made it clear to them, he wasn't interested in being some kind of a bread king. His message wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't what they expected. His words proved to be too hard and too offensive to accept. And for them, Jesus didn't have the answer they were looking for. Does he have the answer for you? What do you make of his words? You know, there are many today who still find Jesus' words too hard to accept. For one reason, they make the way of salvation sound too easy. So, so you mean to tell me that we're saved simply by believing in Jesus with no works of our own? Then others are offended when told that by themselves, they'll never be good enough to enter God's heavenly kingdom. After all, they don't, they don't feel like they're that bad, at least not when compared to the rest of the world. And yet in 1 Corinthians, Paul points out that many, they look to the cross and they see it only as, as Paul calls it, a stumbling block and a bunch of foolishness. For far too many today, the words of Jesus are still too hard and too offensive to accept. May it never be so with us. When seen only with the eyes of our human nature, the words of Jesus seem hard and offensive, begging us to look elsewhere for answers. But don't let your reason or your intellect lead you astray. Let the Spirit show you that Jesus does have the answer, that his words are eternal life for believers. So Jesus now turns his attention to that third group of, of followers, the smaller group, his 12 disciples. He allows them to state their own intentions, picking it up in verse 67. Simple question. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus is saying, are you going to follow the crowd? Or are you willing to remain a minority? See, when you're forced to put your feelings and your beliefs into words, well, they become that much more real. And that's why Jesus wanted the 12 to evaluate their reasons for following him, to verbalize what they truly believed about him so that they would be strengthened in their beliefs. And Jesus wanted them to show that they truly understood and believed the words he had spoken to them. And as we usually was the case, Peter spoke for the entire group in answering Jesus' question. Lord, to whom shall we go? The words behind me on the screen. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
you can't find fault with what came out of Peter's mouth this time. Man has to have spiritual answers for his spiritual problems. And Peter knew that he couldn't find these answers on his own. You see, the answers aren't found in us. They're found only in Jesus. The 12 disciples had come to this knowledge through the work of the Holy Spirit. They knew there was nowhere else to turn. They knew only Jesus had the answer. Yes, only Jesus has the words of eternal life. Well, the time the disciples had spent with Jesus had provided them with the answer to eternal life. So Peter is able to continue by saying, we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus was able to back up everything he claimed to be, and the disciples had listened to his words, and they had come to the conclusion that he was the Holy One of God. Holy in the Hebrew language doesn't just mean without blemish or perfect. It also has the connotation of being set apart for the Lord, and that fits Jesus perfectly. That's what he says as much earlier in the same chapter. He says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And later on, he'll describe himself this way as the one whom the father has set apart as his very own and sent into the world. Jesus was the one set apart by his father to live a holy life for us and then to go to the cross for us, to make us holy by giving his holiness to us and taking our sins from us. No one else lives up to this billing. Only Jesus, as the Holy One of God, has the answer to eternal life. So if Jesus has the final answer when it comes to our salvation, we would be wise to turn to him for answers when confronted with other questions having to do with how to live our lives here on this earth. So instead of tying the Constitution into an illegible knot and trying to define marriage, we open instead our Bibles and we let God define it for us. Instead of trusting our flawed intellect and arrogant reasoning to determine when life begins, let God settle the matter. He tells us in Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And then finally, instead of following the world's logic, assuming that our salvation has to be some kind of cooperative effort between us and our creator, let's just open our ears and listen as God tells us that it's all his doing, apart from any works of our own, and purely a gift of his divine grace. Jesus has the final answer. Proverbs 14 tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So when it comes to our salvation, Jesus is the final answer. He is the way and the truth and the life. He takes all the pressure and all the guilt of our sins off our shoulders, by placing it all on his own, carrying it all to the cross. And now in his word, we're told, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's that simple. And what comforting words. It's God's wonderful promise to each of you. The words of Jesus mean everything to you and to me because they are the words of eternal life. So when looking for answers in life, God's word provides what we're seeking. Let it be your guide in confronting the issues you face as Christians living in a sinful world. But most of all, always remember that when it comes to your salvation, there is only one answer. And it's found in Jesus. Amen. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him that we walk in all his ways. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, to whom all things are known, grant us a true faith that we would honor you not only with our lips, but serve you faithfully with all of our heart, mind, and strength. Gracious Lord, give joy and hope to all your children in remembrance of their baptism, that they may rejoice in the forgiveness of sins that Christ freely pours out in this saving flood. Heavenly Father, preserve us from rejecting your commandments for the doctrines of men. By your Spirit's aid, lead all Christians to keep your commandments in thought, word, and deed. 
honoring you in all that we do. Preserve, O oh Lord, your estate of marriage. Grant that wives would submit to their husbands and husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Gracious Father, bless children of all ages so that they would not despise or anger their father and mother, but always honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Lord of life, guide and lead those facing difficult life and death decisions to make God-pleasing decisions, affirming that life is a precious gift from you. Hear our prayers for our nation and its leaders, for all civil servants, and for those whose work imperils them for the sake of their neighbor. Lord of life, encourage with your word and grace all who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually on account of illness. Bless all medical professionals with the skills necessary to give relief and care to their pain where possible. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Once again, God's blessings to you. May God be with you the week in the week ahead as he has promised. And may he keep you safe and close to him through his words. Blessings on your week. We'll see you again. Take care.